This is a crash course in what is happening to cause GameStop's price to explode, defying all traditional fundamentals. In fact, I've seen some people refer to fundamentals as the new F-word. That's how crazy things have gotten. Okay, so in order to explain this, and I warn you, it's complicated, we need to go over a few basics. We're going to start at a very basic level, but it's going to get pretty gnarly near the end, so grab a drink. Let's explain what most people probably already know, and that is the normal stock trade. A normal stock trade is when you buy a stock at a certain price and hope to sell it later at a higher price. So, for example, let's say we want to buy a stock trading at $10. If we buy 100 shares at $10 per share, we have a total outlay of $1,000. Now, if that stock goes up to $15 per share and then we sell it, we get 15 times 100 shares for a total of $1,500. Yay, we've made a $500 gain or a 50% return on our initial investment. Now, I'm going to ignore trading commissions for now to speed up the explanation, but generally there are commissions for transactions that reduce your returns. We'll just park that for now. Okay, so that's a normal trade, and you'll sometimes hear that as a long position. When someone is long a stock, they think it's going to go up. But if you think a stock is overvalued and is going to go down, then you would want to be short that stock. And one main way of doing that is through short selling. Now, whereas with a normal stock trade, you buy low, sell high, short selling is doing that in reverse. You sell high first and then hope to buy low later, which is completely backwards. And so your first question probably is, how the hell do you sell something that you don't own yet? Okay, so the traditional short sale works like this. Wherever you place your trades at your broker, they may lend you the shares to sell. You pay interest to borrow them, just like any loan. So they lend you the shares and then you sell them. And let's say there's a stock trading at $10 per share and you think it's going to go down. You borrow 100 shares and then sell them for $10 per share and you get $1,000. And if the stock goes down to, say, $8 per share, then you buy 100 shares for $800. You've returned your borrowed shares to your broker, and you are up 200 bucks. Your short position makes money when the stock you shorted goes down. Right. So buying low and selling high, but in reverse. You sold high first and bought low later. Now... Let's say you shorted a stock and the stock went up quickly. You sold it first for $10 per share and you sold 100 shares, so you got $1,000 for that. But the stock went up to $15 per share and you get worried it's going to keep going up. So you exit your short position by buying it for $15 per share and at 100 shares, that will cost you $1,500. Subtract the $1,000 that you got from selling them first and you're down $500. So you lose money if your shorted stock goes up. Remember, you thought it was going to go down, and it went the other way. Okay, so what I've just described is your garden variety short squeeze. When the stock that you shorted, because you thought it was going to go down, instead starts to go up, that puts you into a losing position and you bail. Now, you might bail because maybe you're just nervous about it, but you might also bail because your broker makes a margin call. Now, to understand margin calls, think about a typical secured loan, like an auto loan. You have collateral. In that case, it's the car. And that makes you less risky to the lender because if you default on the loan, they can go after the car. Well, if your shorted stock starts to go up in price, putting you into a losing position, your broker, the lender, is going to be like, hey, guy, how's it going? You good? Yeah, listen, you're going to need to put more money in your account or exit your trade or we're going to have some problems. So in some cases, the short squeeze is amped up by pressure to keep your lender happy. And the reason that a short squeeze can get hairy real quick is that there is a positive feedback cycle that kicks in. See, if you cover your short, which is just a fancy way of saying you buy back your shorted stock to exit your trade, remember, you are buying those shares. Buying pressure pushes up the stock price. 
the increasing stock price might force others to cover their shorts and so on and so forth. And that's one way a bit of a runaway can occur in a stock price going up in a short squeeze. But wait, there's so much more to this than just the garden variety short squeeze. This really only partially explains the GameStop story. It looks like there's so much more at play than that. You may have heard the term gamma squeeze. All right, so this is where it's going to start to get a little bit more technical, but bear with me. I'm going to do my best to walk you through this. A gamma squeeze can be like a short squeeze on steroids, where those steroids themselves were given steroids. And then those steroids were given a keg of Red Bull and then put into one of those high G centrifuges they put astronauts into to make their faces look like Jeremy Clarkson driving an aerial atom. Yeah, so that's what a gamma squeeze can be like. So let's explain what it really is mechanically. But in order to do that, we need to understand how options work. And this is where we go from here to here in terms of getting technical. And I said, I'm going to do my best to make it easy to understand, but options trading is a mind job when you first learn about it. And we're just going to focus on just the tip of the iceberg. Just the tip. Okay, let's start with a basic definition of an option, or more correctly, an option contract. And for now, I'll just explain a call option contract because that's the first one most people learn about and most people never go beyond that. When you buy a call option contract, you are buying the option, which is the right, but not the obligation to purchase shares of a certain stock at a set price for a limited amount of time. And when that time period expires, the option to buy those shares at that set price expires too. Okay, so what the heck does that really mean? I think it's probably best to just explain with an example. We're just going to dive in. Let's say GameStop stock was trading at $20 per share. And you thought it was going to go up. You might buy a call option contract that gives you the right to buy it for $25 per share for the next 30 days, for argument's sake. But that call option might be priced at $1. That means that if you pay $1 right now, then for the next 30 days, no matter how high GameStop stock price gets, you could exercise your right to buy it for $25 per share. Even if it got up to $30 per share, those next 30 days, you still get to buy it at $25 per share. That's the contract. That option contract you bought gives you that right. Okay, so look at the appeal of doing this. You only put up $1, and if the stock goes over $25, bucks, you can exercise your right to buy it at $25. So if it did go up to $30, you could still buy it for $25, and then immediately sell it for $30 right away and make a $5 gain, less the $1 that you spent to buy that contract in the first place. So a $4 gain on $1 invested. Now, in reality you would just sell the option contract, which would have increased in price to about $5. Now, there's one thing to note about option contracts is that each contract represents the option to buy 100 shares. So you have to multiply all these numbers by 100. But these option contracts trade like stocks with bid and ask spreads, and the values of these option contracts fluctuates. So really, you would have had to put up $100 to buy this one contract, it would have given you the right to buy 100 shares of the stock at $25 per share for the next 30 days in this case. And if the underlying stock went up to $30 per share, you would have had a gain of $400 off your initial $100 investment. That's a gain of 400% insanity. If you just bought the underlying stock, then buying 100 shares at $20 per share, which is the initial price in this example, you would need to invest $2,000. And if the stock got up to $30 per share, you could sell it for $3,000, leaving you with a $1,000 gain. And that represents a 50% gain on your investment. Now, the flip side of call option contract is when you own it and the underlying stock never hits the strike price of, in this case, $25. And the option contract expires and then you've lost 100% of your investment. 
Now, if you're only putting up $100 in this specific case, you might see that dollar loss as an acceptable risk. But where things get even more out of control is when people start to swing for the fences and put all $2,000 into buying 20 of our example option contracts. If the strike price never gets hit, they stand to lose $2,000, which again is 100% of their investment, but now the dollar losses are getting really high. And it's very likely that they might lose that money. But they are praying for the stock to pop. And if it did, and let's say it hit that $30 per share, their 20 option contracts could be sold for $10,000, which represents an $8,000 gain. So the takeaway here is that these types of option trades can be used to incredibly magnify the possible gains and losses. Now that you have a cursory understanding on a basic call option, and we've only covered the broad strokes, the next thing we need to understand is how options trading volumes have exploded over time. This is not Benjamin Graham's stock market. Take a look at just how much the game has changed. Here's a chart showing that options trading volume on single stocks for the first time was higher than trading volume for the underlying stocks themselves. And this happened in 2020, and it has been a meteoric rise. Trading volumes on single stock options more than doubled in just 2020 alone. And I think that this has big implications. And here's why I think this increase in this type of trading behavior may be very important in the GameStop story. The next thing we need to understand are what are called options market makers. Long story short, because we can go down a deep, deep rabbit hole on this, is that a pure market maker provides liquidity to the market so investors can buy and sell, in this case, options. The pure market maker does not seek to profit from betting against you. It profits from providing a bid-ask spread, and they seek to be market neutral with all the securities they hold or have sold to investors. I know. Let's just fast forward to an example. An investor wants to buy call options on a stock. Let's say it's GameStop. And the current share price is $50. The call option buyer, the investor, wants to buy one call option contract with a strike price of $100. The market maker sells this call option to the investor. So the investor stands to gain if the stock makes a big move to the upside. But right now, the market maker is on the other side of that trade, and they stand to lose if the stock goes up because they'll be the ones on the hook if the investor exercises their right to call those shares away from the market maker. But the market maker doesn't want to bet against you, so they need to hedge their exposure away. One way that they do this by buying some of the underlying shares themselves. That way, if the stock does go up and the market maker also owns some shares of the stock, then they will make a gain on owning those shares, even though they are making a loss on having sold you those call option contracts. So the market maker can completely offset their exposure to market movements by appropriately hedging. One basic hedging technique is called delta hedging. I know, bear with me. If you don't know much about options, this is going to sound weird, but there are a number of factors that explain how much an option contract should be priced for, and these are called the five Greeks, delta, gamma, vega, theta, and rho. So we're just gonna look at the first two, delta and gamma. And again, I think it's easiest just to dive right into an example. Let's say we have a stock ABC. The share price of stock ABC is $20 per share. A call option contract for stock ABC that expires in two months with a strike price of $25 is priced at $1. Delta is an estimate for how much the option contract will change in price for every $1 of change in the underlying share price of ABC. So if the delta was 0.3, that means that the expected change in the value of the option contract would be $1 times 0.3 or 30 cents 
if stock ABC changed in price from $20 to $21 per share. So the new option contract value goes up from $1 to $1.30, which is a 30% gain. But now the delta will have changed. Now the delta is maybe 0.4. And if stock ABC went up another $1 from $21 to $22, then the option contract may go up from $1.30 to $1.70. Delta will again increase. And this is where gamma fits in. Gamma is the first derivative of delta. In other words, it's the rate of change in the rate of change in how an option contract is valued when the underlying stock price changes. To make a long story short, a market maker who wants to maintain a market neutral position may not only delta hedge, but also gamma hedge. And here's the important part. There are a few ways to do this. And, and don't worry if you really didn't follow on the delta and the gamma stuff. Here's the really important thing to note about specifically gamma hedging. There are a few ways to gamma hedge. One, buy even more underlying stock, which adds to the buying pressure of the stock. Or two, the market maker could buy some higher strike call options from someone else, which may in turn force someone else to buy more underlying stock to hedge their position and so on and so forth. And so that is a crash course in what's called a gamma squeeze. Okay, so let's put this all together. GameStop is a company that is a mall-based store that sells physical copies of video games and related things. People can download games from home these days, so some people thought this would be a bad business to be in for the future, and so they thought the price of the stock should go down, and so they short-sold the stock, namely a whole bunch of hedge fund billionaires. An activist investor joins the board of GameStop, and many people believe that he will turn things around, and so other investors start to buy the stock as they think it's going to go up. This creates buying demand for the shares. The squeeze starts. Meanwhile, highly speculative investors decide to use call options to juice their possible gains if the stock does go up. And option trading volumes have already been exploding in recent years in a subreddit called Wall Street Bets, where millions of members conjure up and share highly speculative bets in the markets, many of whom who live in this world of high student debt, high house prices, job precarity, and grew up watching Wall Street get bailed out with no love for the little guy. They launch an onslaught of buying shares and call options, partly to teach the short sellers a lesson. Options market makers buy shares to Delta Hedge, which further increases buying pressure. The stock keeps going up with all this buying pressure, forcing more short sellers to cover their shorts by buying more shares. A massive feedback cycle is fueled even further and the stock price explodes. Short sellers lose billions. Market makers increase their buying of shares and may start to buy their own higher strike call options to hedge both Delta and Gamma, which in turn creates even more and more buying pressure and the stock price just went to the moon. And that's one theory as to how a more garden variety short squeeze coupled with an explosion in riskier option trading by investors in general and the Wall Street bet speculators specifically adds a gamma squeeze to the traditional short squeeze and becomes one of the most incredible market distortions we've seen in a lifetime. And if you're wondering if you should get in on this action, no. Okay, that's it. If you like this video, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video.